Welcome everyone to our Inside the Box lecture series. And this is the last uh, lecture of the spring semester. It's a finale. And I am so delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mitchell Joachim. I met Mitchell, I think it was at least 10 years ago. And I followed his career. It's so amazing. He goes from one amazing project to another, incredibly inventive. And I know that this semester is about transportation design. And I thought, well, how does Mitchell really fit into this? Because I wanted him to speak so much. And I knew about his um, research on compacted cars on a project about butterflies and another project about crickets. So I thought it was fair game to include Mitchell in this and to really use Mitchell as a finale to the semester. So I'm gonna read his biography. So uh, bear with me, it all deserves being read because as I said, it's quite amazing. Mitchell's co-founder of Terraform One and an associate professor of practice at NYU. Formerly, he was an architect in the offices of Frank Gehry and I.M. Pei. He has been awarded a Fulbright scholarship and fellowships with TED, Moshe Safdi, and Martin Society for Sustainability, MIT. He was chosen by Wired Magazine for the Smart List and selected by Rolling Stone for the 100 People Who Are Changing America. Mitchell won many honors, including the Lafarge um, Holtim Ant Architect R plus D Award, AIA New York Urban Design Merit Award, First Place International Architecture Award. Uh, there's so many here, oh, many awards for sustainability, History Channel Infinity Award for City of the Future, the Time Magazine's Best Invention with MIT Smart Cities. He's V featured as the now 99 in Dwell Magazine and 50 under 50 innovators of the 21st century by Images Publishers. He has co-authored four books and I'm not gonna go through the titles. Um, we'll get them in our library. His design work has been exhibited at MoMA and at the Venice Biennale. He earned his PhD at MIT, his master's of architecture and urban design at Harvard and his MARC at Columbia University. I want to welcome Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. It is super good to be here, uh, to be in the finale. Sounds like no pressure on my part. So I will do my best by far, which I always do, but to live up to that, uh, I guess that statement or the, the uh, conclusion of what seems to be a phenomenal lecture series. So I uh, always love SVA. Uh, actually, New York and everything that happens in New York is is just incredible, always has been. We are here in the Brooklyn Navy Yards, and uh, I invite everyone at some point to come and check out what we're doing because it is pretty incredible. Uh, this is a great space to make, uh, to build, to create, to invent, and that's what we're doing. I'm, I'm going to show some of the projects we've been up to, and I'm going to talk about transportation today a little bit and then show some butterflies and crickets on top of that because we do a lot of different things here. Uh, but um, yeah, my, my work at MIT was in smart cities and, and transportation. So my dissertation was all about that. So I'm going to get into kind of the big picture histories of urban design and ideas that, that uh, really look at kind of a history of the future when it comes to moving in cities and different technologies and methods and literally the craziest ideas ever. And some of them are, are reaching fruition and they're becoming a reality every day. So let me see, you'll share screen. Uh, where's this thing? That thing, share. Okay, you guys see that okay? Yep. Uh, and it looks sexy and big on the screen. It's all right? Yeah. Sure does. Okay, perfect. So uh, I, Terraform One is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We are a think tank to look at the future of socio-ecological design. So anything that's green, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, working to save the planet, that's our goals. Uh, these are some of the books that Carol mentioned. I'm not gonna unpack them all, but the last one, Design with Life, uh, Biotech Architecture and Resilient Cities, represents over 400 people that have worked with us over the years. 
uh, and it's quite a monograph that dives very deeply into the projects I'm going to show. So check that out. You know, this is what we work for every day is what we wake up in the morning and uh, attempt to do, and that is design against extinction. So roughly 50% or more of all wildlife on this planet has disappeared since the 1970s. So that's within the last 50 years, we've lost uh, a lot of uh, everything from insects to large mammals to coral reefs to birds of all kinds. It comes down to every nine minutes, we lose another species on this planet. We are all responsible. So when it comes to dealing with sustainability issues, that's how important it is. Uh, this is one of the kinds of designs that we produce that are representative of what I call socio-ecological design. Here we're rethinking on a level of anticipatory design or, or speculation what a future street might be in our cities. So here we imagine a riparian corridor replacing traffic. Uh, this goes through the center of our street. It's filled with all kinds of aqueous life. We have trackless trains that deal with high throughput transportation so we can move from you know, across town quite easily. We open this up to be a, a civic space. So it's, it's really privileging the pedestrian to explore streets. We got some level of automation to take care of what I call productive green spaces. So all the surfaces and rooftops of buildings are as green as possible, but not just for decoration. In fact, they're not for decoration. They're for air quality. They're for food production or for their energy generation. So we got photovoltaic cells, vertical axis wind turbines, we got different types of gardens for eating, et cetera. All of these things happen in an idea of a future socio-ecological street. Now, whether that comes to some level of reality, that's not the point. The point is it's part propaganda, part activism, and all design. So the argument here is let's work towards a vision of that future or many visions. This is not gonna be one of them that's dominating. It's all of us kind of coming up with these ideas and fighting tooth and nail to get there. So. Here's an image that takes us back, you know, over 100 years, and this is a little bit of the history of how we think of future streets and green urbanism. This is Harry Pettit's uh, King's Dream of New York, where he imagined, uh, and this is a real estate catalog, all kinds of dirigibles or flying airships docking into skyscraper ports or at the terminus of tall buildings, clusters of skyscrapers connected by bridge systems. So transportation and circulation happened in elevator cores and would extend across streets on these bridges. And then a canyonated system of mobility where we had horses and carriages and high-speed cars and pedestrians on multiple levels that take up the street plane. And, and, and yet these visions continue. The, the inventor of urban planning here, Patrick Gates, I teach a course at NYU on this individual, so I, I can't do him justice in one slide, but this is one of his most important drawings, roughly from the exact same time as King's Dream of New York. Here he's imagining mobility in cities affected by our resource creation and management and the tools and instrumentation that would extract those resources to create cities. So we go from the minor with the uh, pickaxe to the woodsman, to the hunter with the bow and arrow, the shepherd to the plow for the peasant, and then people uh, fishing, fish nets, et cetera. All of that is a cut through the first mobility system that humans used, which was estuaries or rivers. And all of these systems from mountain ranges to forests to fields, that entire valley section cuts through and adds to how cities are created. It's a combination of topophilia, geography, planning, social science, all of that happened in that one drawing. And then here is another variation of a historical idea of moving in cities. This is uh, a linear city. One of many models is one of the first ones. This is Ed Chambliss, where he ha imagined high throughput transportation would happen underground. And then on the top would be these sort of spaces for leisure and slow moving transportation. And then the entire city would be in this snake-like system that moves throughout the landscape. Quite interesting. And then here, uh, Corbet, a uh, Columbia professor, 1913, was looking at, again, transportation systems that affected cargo and freight, subway systems underground, delivering goods and services. And then buses and trolleys uh, above and light rail systems, then autonomous vehicles, cars, 
moving or I say uh, vehicles that are individual based vehicles and then different sections of the city lifted for pedestrians to move on bridges or skywalks and you can see he's actually thinking of cutting through the urban fabric over time so this dichroic section shows first in the upper right hand corner a congested horrible street with everything clustered together nasty and then eventually carving away into the architecture, lifting pedestrians off the street, providing zones for high speed transportation, slow movement, parking, and then areas for free of all of that for pedestrians to move about in their leisure to go shopping or to access their housing. And then getting further into the future, uh, this is Santella here, La City Novia, where he imagined an aesthetic of mobility built into the structures of our architecture, where elevators and escalators and people movers, all of these systems would become part of the fabric or the tapestry of movement in cities. And here it was sort of extruded to the outside, kind of like your guts on the outside, so that you this reveal uh, becomes the kind of the dominant spectacle. And then even further, uh, Francesco Mallorca, here in 1917, thinking about putting all of the heavy transportation in these deep valleys and then raising the city above on these civic plains and having these grand uh, axes points for sculpture and for imaging the city and also for parades and public spaces. And then you'd have all the nasty traffic really low to the ground. This became the BQE. So this version of the future, not so good because it divides neighborhoods, separates communities, is, a, is more of a blight on the landscape than something positive. Uh, this is yet another version of thinking about transportation at the scale of the person. So here we've got moving platforms from the Paris exhibition and a proposal in Atlanta where the streets or the sidewalks themselves are conveyance systems. They're belts that keep you moving. So you jump on the sidewalk, you move at different bands at different speeds till eventually you get too fast and you have to sit down. So the thought was keep the sidewalks constantly flowing and people never need to stop. You're always moving in this system. And then this one I love by Raymond Hood getting further into the now 1929. This is turning bridges into both housing and mobility systems. So here he imagined bridges and skyscrapers becoming one kind of contiguous system. And that in this future version uh, projected for 1950, that all of the bridges in Manhattan connecting us to New Jersey and the different boroughs would be, would be these hyperforms of mobility where you'd have housing and structures on the bridges themselves and they would link to these massive tall building clusters that you can see that make up a multimodal city itself. So one very interesting vision didn't quite come true, but there was an anticipation of congestion, huge amounts of folks in cities and population movements that we just didn't know how to deal with. And it's, in many ways that's come true today. I mean, I've never had a great day driving in Manhattan or I guess in, even in Brooklyn these days. And then Norman Belgates, whoops, sorry, what the hell happened? Uh, did that just disappear? Oh, yeah. This is Futurama and the World's Fair. So Norman Belgates thought that congestion could be solved if we made everything sleek and fast, gave it pointy noses and big fins. And the idea is the aesthetic of speed built into buildings, trains, cars, and having them move fast would stop the problems that we see with congestion. And this was part of the World's Fair. This model was the size of about a football field and you could travel on these large chairs and check out all the different uh, 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 aspects of these models about speed and mobility. And then I put this in, this is Hilbesheimer. He escaped Nazi Germany to look at ideas of changing Manhattan. This is probably the largest change of Manhattan in its history. I don't think any mayors ever come up with this idea and Robert Moses must have been super jealous because here he's wiping out the entire Manhattan grid, Hilbesheimer, and he's replacing it with this giant ring road, slabs of housing in the center, the entire place is one big park, and then massive rows of parking on either side. Okay, Hilbesheimer. Uh, not going to happen, but interesting nonetheless. And then Louis Kahn in, in 1951. Here he's getting into 
the details of the, the kind of the, the buildings themselves and looking at clusters of towers, connecting parking, connecting ramps, connecting mobility to where we live. And this was done for Philadelphia and he's done some great planning for Philadelphia. And then Motopia, uh, as I get for it now, we're in the 60s. So we've got a lot of experimental drug use and big ideas and all kinds of uh, inventiveness happening. And here they reverse the figure ground of New York City. So where there were buildings, there's parks and where there were streets, we now have buildings. So turning streets into buildings and where buildings used to be beautiful green spaces. They're not productive green spaces. They're more for leisure. Uh, for throwing a frisbee around or you know walking your dog, but still, nonetheless, it's this incredible switch of the tapestry. And I think Motopia is quite a beautiful project. And then getting further into 60s and 70s, we have these guys, which is uh, the archogram, uh, and this is Ron Heron, where we imagine cities themselves walking. If someone hasn't told you about this in your time studying SVA, I don't know what to say, but now you've finally seen it. This is probably one of the most wild visions you can have of mobility and cities together. These are ideas that the city itself can move and go from place to place. And it's a massive project. I suggest you look further into it. Oops, sorry. And then here we have uh, more practical ones done for uh, Manhattan. This is the Lower Manhattan Expressway. Paul Rudolph, a great architect, looking at building on top of the free space or the space above our highways uh, and taking advantage of producing these inclined planes for housing to maximize light and air on the interior and then autonomous transportation just below that in the spine and then vehicular transportation even further below that. The whole system fits alongside our major highways and then moves into these clusters of tall buildings. And then examples that have been built so it's not just these ideas, but after a big history of thinking about this, what are cases where you can find buildings that combine mobility, housing, and trend, multimodal transportation all in one system? So here, Marina City is a place to move boats, a place for taxis, a place for uh, parking your car, a place to live, all on these kind of corn cob like towers. One of the few topologies that actually succeeded in doing that. And then LTL architects did something really radical. So here we're getting into uh, the 2000s, actually. They switched floor plates. So instead of having one stack of parking and then a stack of housing, they switched the systems together. So you mix it like a stack of cards and you have parking by housing, by office, by parking, by housing, by office, all of that interconnected. So these interstitial zones between the four plates get expanded and they become parking zones while above and below are areas for people and for different programmatic functions such as office spaces or housing. This is quite an interesting project. And then what I was doing at MIT was in part some of this. So this is thinking about the future of DC, but here is looking at omnidirectional vehicles, new types of energy systems, uh, Meglev transportation, uh, pre-hyperloop thinking. This is an image of Tom Cruise jumping from one sort of omnidirectional vehicle to another in this film, Minority Report, where you have something called Transylvators, not Transylvania, but Transylvators. So it's a translating elevator that goes, sticks on the surface of buildings and moves laterally into highway systems. And then these vehicles, the cars, are a part of the skin of the building. So these vehicles, are not separate. They're actually a part of the interior of the apartment. So you jump out of your apartment window, fly into your car, fall down the surface of the building, and off you go. So this was uh, done for Steven Spielberg. We started looking at how do we build something like this? So a lot of my designs looked at these 360 degree systems for wheels, that you can use with small robotic wheels, drivetrain, suspension, motoring, or inside the wheels. And then they actually grip the sides of buildings when they hit the top point, so it's not doing jumping jacks, and they could spin and vertically move upwards. And then looking at the surfaces of those vehicles, the skins changing, all different relationships with the material and the skin. Here we're using e-ink, and we have a visor 
that's on a completely transparent bubble car that tracks the sun. So you're never blinded by sunlight. So this one solid opaque form tracks the sun or the inverse of that, the entire car is opaque and wherever you look out, it detints the window and you could see out that particular plane. And we had a lot of fun actually making these things. Let's see if this video plays. This is a drivetrain and a suspension system and a modicum of intelligence inside a robotic wheel. So the entire vehicle was the wheel itself and you add two or three of these wheels together and you get any kind of a car. So it doesn't have to be this particular, this is just a bicycle version we made, but showing that the wheel is car and car is wheel all in one. And then you just buy that particular thing and design any body for that car. Uh, so we had a lot of fun doing that. And then just once you have those wheels, what could those bodies be? At the time I was obsessed with softness. So created these uh, soft cars uh, sustainable Omni Flow Transport, S, uh, you know, S O F T. Here they're made out of air bladders for the interior and ETFE quilts. All of it's predicated on the ideas of safety cells and making cars that are lightweight, that are uh, scuffable, that are designed for congestion. They move in flocks and herds. Here, these are another version of that car called the Hug and Kiss Lamb Car. It's a car designed to bump up against other cars or rub up against them. And that's fine. If you bump into another car, you don't get mad. You just, you know, stop reading because you're probably not driving. The car is driving itself. And you look at the person next to you and you say, chow, as you move in your flock of sheep cars. And these, these, uh, these cars are, uh, don't need to move faster than 25 miles an hour. That's the speed limit pretty much in New York. Well, that is a speed limit in New York and similar to Paris and Shanghai. That's how fast you need to go. A uh, vehicle like this, if it hits a pedestrian, it would more or less tickle them because it's just a beach ball on wheels as opposed to killing people. And then here's a, 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 an idea of translating vehicles from red, shiny, precious metal boxes, which are today's cars, into these blue and white soft hug and kiss vehicles. And when they're moving in intelligent clusters and flocks of cars, when they find a Hummer on the road or some big metal box, the sheep cars just basically surround it and push it off to the side of the street as they take over the roadways. So power in numbers. This is another version of these vehicles called a stackable car. These are vehicles that extend when you want to use them and they stand up and interlock like shopping carts. So you can get around 300 of them on a New York City block. They're a shared ownership model like Zip or Uber. You just click and get inside, use the car as it expands, go where you want. When you get out of it, the car stands up again and interlocks to the other vehicles and begins to charge on the street. It also helps create microgrids or battery systems that can help power buildings. So they're not just vehicles, they're kind of an emergency backup grid for buildings themselves. This is the one that we productized. It took 15 years from thinking about this stuff at MIT to one that we made. It's called the Heroku. It's a car that you could purchase for around 18,000 euros. Uh, it's a car that stands up. It's omnidirectional. It's drive by wire. You get off in the front. The door, the, there is no side doors. Instead, the door is like a refrigerator door in the front. It opens, it opens up directly onto the sidewalk. So ingress and egress is safe. Uh, the car, the thesis for this car is that the entire 20th century was designed around the automobile. It's now time to design automobiles to fit cities, not cities around cars. So that was uh, the concept there. Uh, this is when we launched it. That was the, uh, the, one of our investors and the president of the European Union at the time when we launched the vehicle. Uh, you know, it was ahead of its time. Uh, there, there, was, there was a number of them sold but it had been discontinued mostly because we were crushed by other bigger, nastier car manufacturers. Uh, they didn't like the fact it was electric and everything else that we were doing. Too much future in that car, fine. Uh, but we definitely got car manufacturers to think about more and more people moving into cities and the desire to have less of these giant SUV things because we don't need them. We took similar designs, uh, Terraform to doing versions of it in Shanghai. These are stackable cars that park on the sides of sidewalks. They have dedicated lanes for moving at higher speeds and then slower speeds on the side. 
And then taking other versions and it's just not because, you know, we only do cars, but we looked at jetpacks. We looked at different types of blimps, blimp bu bumper buses, and how they would move freight systems and people around the future of our cities. We're not there yet, but doing this research and making these arguments up front and looking at the energy systems behind it and how efficient they can be, because moving in a jetpack, just as an example, jetpacks have been around since the 80s. Uh, it takes you about three minutes to go from Brooklyn to Wall Street. And if you did it by car, it's easily 30 minutes and that doesn't include parking. So we looked at new types of three-dimensional cities that explore transportation and the design of transportation at all different scales and speeds. Uh, oops, I somehow forgot to do my timer. So I'm gonna start that again. Okay, I'm looking at time, sorry. So this is called the, uh, the Blimp Bumper Bus. It's you kind of hop on and hop off. It only moves it around anywhere from 15 to 20 miles an hour. It gently wafts through city streets. The, the fantasy here is every single day is the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. It takes about 40, usually men, to hold down these uh, giant balloons of Spider-Man and SpongeBob. Here, we're just using that same kind of system, but as a, a lightweight transportation system. Funicular wires control it, so it moves on a very clear pathway, and you have this, these very soft uh, bus systems that move in New York City. We also looked at making the jetpack viable. One of the biggest problems with jetpacks is they have no interior spaces. Bam, they're always some guy or person on the outside exposed to all the elements in a fancy helmet. What if we could start thinking about soft uh, systems that skin it and create interior spaces so you can move with two people instead of one or one person and cargo and be in a comfortable weatherproof environment as you're doing it. So this system that I had drawn uh, is exactly that, is a, a, a jetpack system that also moves in flocks and herds and it's super soft and lightweight. It uses a, a catalyzed metal to produce basically uh, um, a pressure system that, that allows the jets to operate for about 30 minutes maximum. And that's all the time you need to get to where you're going. Uh, there's also a parachute system in the crotch in case all hell breaks loose, the parachute, parachute just busts out of your crotch. That just was the best area to put it. Uh, here's another view of that system. And, then if you think that's too uh, heavyweight and, and, and too uh, futuristic or uh, maybe too expensive, this is one of my favorite sports. It's called cluster ballooning. It's basically just as good as those jetpacks. It was on the cover of Aerospace Magazine. And uh, yep, it's like that Disney movie Up. Use a bunch of helium balloons and you have some wire-based control and you can pretty much get to where you're going, uh, depending on the wind, but it, it requires almost no energy to do it. So it'd be great if we see thousands of New Yorkers every morning commuting with cluster balloons. I mean, that's what I think of. And then all these systems operating together in the future of our streets, like what does that look like? What are the consequences? Well, here it's important that we privilege bicycles and pedestrians. Think of a system of ballards that separate moving transport devices that are larger from smaller ones, such as bikes and people, and then looking at different systems, kind of uh, providing areas for waiting and for pickup and drop off. All of those systems are changed because you, know, you don't need a bus shelter if you know exactly when the bus is gonna be there. So you dress for the weather and walk outside and pick it up. And you should look at also maximizing transport. So people who wanna share a via or a lift, you can coordinate where to do the pickups, et cetera. So you don't really need those shelters and other systems. So we looked at new types of bus stops and car parking and bike storage, all of this with these, uh, what we call smart dots, smart dots and soft mobs. So the streets themselves send off signals and let you know what's happening inside those vehicles and their AI systems because it's very scary. You don't necessarily know what those cars are up to. So we want to make the streets clarify and signal what's happening to the vehicle systems that are all computationally controlled. We do that through many different systems, but here's one that looks at the Ballards or a different type of bio-waste bush system or e-bushes or smart grass or lighting systems, LEDs. All of them are combining different aspects of enhancing our streets dealing with uh, stormwater and wastewater runoff, 
dealing with powering your phones or streeteries, all of this becoming into a system of dots that are a plug and play method for our future streets. And then let me get into a couple, uh, just a few more projects. Uh, here is what we're doing at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So this is thinking about water-based transportation and freight and an idea of, of architecture that is uh, absolutely reclaimed. So we're looking at old ship halls and sections of ship and sh uh, ship parts and repurposing them, these mobility devices, uh, to no longer deliver at the industrial scale that they do, but to think into the next century as we deal with problems of, of wastewater and, and, and high flooding and tidal rising, uh, everything that's happening because of climate change. We look at creating a new type of system that are underground reefs that the ships provide that go alongside these, these holes are sunken alongside the edges of cities and build in a new kind of buffer zone between human programmatic needs and areas for nature. So here we begin slowly adapting uh, and creating new wetlands along our hard edges that we find in New York City. So many of these edges are these very they're hard coffered dams. Instead, we provide these soft sort of boundaries of these ship holes that are sunk and over time, we let nature take them over. And sometimes they're usable for humans, other times they're just taken over for aqueous life. And we just use all these reclaimed ship vessels to do that. We did this for a project in Governor's Island and here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Carol, about how much time do I have left? Because I lost my um, signal here. I don't, I don't hear you. It's 8.10 right now. So you probably like another 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Thank you. So this is, uh, we're looking at transforming the Brooklyn Navy Yard for freight delivery systems and passion, passenger delivery systems, transforming all of the existing dry docks so they merge with the architecture. In fact, we wanted to have no distinction between landscape, architecture, and transportation. So it's 300 acres of urban space. Terraform was thinking about merging different use systems from uh, uh, ecological restoration to combined sewage overflow to freight delivery, all inside this massive rethink of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So here is the kind of the landscape changing into usable uh, spaces for construction and building and maker spaces, as well as ecological restoration and bioswales to absorb water and areas to clean sewage. All of these services, city services used for the city combined into this new idea of the Brooklyn Navy Yard that actually led to the building that we're in now. And then here, no, uh, sorry, it's okay. You guys can still see me. Uh, here we actually went even further, taking the taking ideas from the Soviets. I'm sorry, but they, they had some good ideas back then, and rethinking uh, housing and keeping housing on wheels. Uh, why do that? Well, the Soviets were afraid. This was called the disurbanists. Were afraid that Americans would uh, nuke them, especially in Moscow. So they dreamed of their populations constantly living and moving on wheels. So they would never stop. And they would always be in this slow moving flow. And the advantage to that is, and here's some of these, uh, the fun picture in the village. This is from Physical Graffiti, but where mom and pop come and visit you in their moving suburban house. They stay for a couple of weeks and then they leave. Uh, but the thought here is that if you retool American infrastructure and highways, to deal with waste, water, food, energy, air quality, actually equity and mobility itself. So you're moving goods and services the same time you move population based on climate conditions, you radically transform this country into a place that becomes super optimized. Yes, is that, I don't expect everyone to do that. That's not the point, but the idea is an exercise or a speculation. It actually is kind of happening. If you ever looked at Amazon and the amount of stuff that moves through those uh, warehouses and trucks just on a per second basis, it's as if they move cities themselves. They're moving all kinds of products and delivering it to your front door. It's happening. We don't really notice it because we, it's kind of invisible, but it's not. So why not think of the population slowly moving at that same level and moving to fit that demand on whatever it might be? 
So here is a, a, a project we did for a gallery where we had all of the American suburbs joining cities and flow, constantly flowing into place. We had a lot of fun with these models. They look ridiculous, they are ridiculous, but they're crazy and we had a good time doing it. We rethought all of infrastructure. So here's the future American highway where housing, waste, food, water, energy is built alongside this moving American suburb. Here's some of the views of that. I mean, the great thing is if you have a moving house, you know, one day you can stop in an area, have a meet your neighbors, have a crazy house party, and then just drive away at three or four o'clock in the morning and they'll never see you again. Here's some of those views of these moving houses. And we had a lot of fun with Mies van der Rohe as uh, moving house farms here. It's a kind of a pig farm. Uh, actually, this is, this is Philip Johnson, who's Mies van der Rohe is the real brain behind Philip Johnson. But here, moving inside a field. And then uh, just because we, we, we wanted to talk about butterflies, I'm going to show the butterfly project. Uh, because this really represents design against extinction is very much about mobility and i i can end on here because i'm probably exhausting everyone uh, so this project a client came to us and said can you give us a green building we said we don't do green buildings we do super green buildings do you give it do you care about something else besides your profits and and just people living inside there so there's a building in lolita uh near lafayette brought near storefront for art and architecture actually and the concept here was to save the American monarch butterfly. It's native to New York. They actually live over generations between Mexico and New York, and uh, they're going extinct. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is showing that their population is decreasing massively. That's in part because we kill, all, we remove all the milkweed, and they need that to lay eggs. So, in the skin of our building. We anticipate how these butterflies move in and out of the building. So we look at the mobility of the, mother, the butterfly, and then we look at its life cycle, its egg laying phase, its caterpillar phase, its gracili stage, its adult stage, how it, re, how it propagates or reproduces. We actually have a patent on this system to, do, to place uh, butterfly uh, terrariums to what we call uh, vertical meadows on the skin of any existing structure. And it doesn't only have to be for butterflies, it could be for different avian creatures or reptiles or what have you. Uh, and here we have the sanctuary that is a vertical meadow that fits on the exterior skin of a building, wraps around to a pollinator garden on the rooftop. The atriums have all areas for milkweed, and then it extends to a park across the street. We project in large scale screens, uh, OLED screens. We got a grant from, doesn't matter, Sony was a part of this. But they, they were very interested in, in showing the drama of these small little creatures, much, much larger. So people, you know, from 400 feet away can tell what's happening in this butterfly building. We designed all kinds of feeders for butterflies. Butterflies were our clients for about three years. So these are painted ladies and things that they like to drink. We also designed the entire uh, butterfly feeder exhibition for the American Museum of Natural History. So these are the feeders that we got a red dot award for uh, that are installed at, in the Natural History Museum. And we learned what butterflies like to drink, which is Gatorade, believe it or not, but they also like different fruits and lime rinds and orange peels, uh, areas to lay their eggs, large scale 3D printing systems for eventual structures for butterflies. Here we're looking at butterfly perching and mud baths. And then designing uh, using zero VOC silicon mold uh, and these large scale 3D prints for the program of butterfly, designing where butterflies could live inside buildings. This is a concrete that's the greenest you can make. It sequesters carbon by putting fly ash in the concrete. We did this with BASF. And then these systems skin the inside surface of a building and they become this interior space for butterflies. So when you look out the window, you see this beautiful garden, a meadow that goes vertically up the building instead of just staring out of your office and looking at traffic. Uh, it's a 50% window to wall aperture. We have these bioplastic lashes and feeders, mud baths, perch points. This was installed at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian in their triennial show. This is a two ton fully operational facade system, double skin facade designed for butterflies as a sanctuary to keep the monarchs going. It helps jumpstart their population. It won't stop them from extinction, 
but certainly gets people interested in this as a topic and interested in saving these absolutely beautiful creatures. We didn't keep butterflies in the exhibition because they're not there for human spectacle, but they're certainly there for, we, we had them for one day and we put in a different system. The uh, Smithsonian is not a zoo and that's important to recognize that. Anyway, I'm gonna stop here. I love to get some questions from you guys and hear what you think or criticisms or angry rants or, or love beams, whatever you got, I'm, I'm all ears. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you uh, very much.